studied to be a lawyer, um, didn't really want to be a lawyer, so I was a lawyer for a very short time. I was an entrepreneur post that for about five or six years. And um, after I had sold the company that uh, I was running, I decided to spend some time in the, in, in the non-profit space. I didn't have any clear idea as to why. So um, I went around to a bunch of non-profits and Pratham Books had been interesting enough for over six months. So I spent six months there and then the intention was always to go and study. But I enjoyed it so much that I ended up staying another year. And uh, it's been five years, well, five, so nearly six years since I started at Pratham Books. Um, I finished with Pratham Books in December of last year. I now remain an advisor to them. And over the course of the five years that I was with them, I kind of helped put together the idea of an open publishing model as opposed to the traditional publishing model, which is driven by a, a very closed universe. The idea really was to help Pratham Books achieve its mission of a book in every child's hand. And we leveraged the idea of um, open source uh, Creative Commons licenses and communities to help put together what we call an open or social publishing model to actually help drive the mission of a book in every child's hand. Since uh, January 1st of this year, I've been with the Akshara Foundation full time where I manage the Karnataka Learning Partnership platform, which is uh, really a multi-stakeholder, data-driven platform to bring transparency and accountability to public preschooling and primary school. I have to admit, I haven't been engaged with the open source movement in uh, any significant way. Um, to a limited extent, my work at Pratham Books was around the idea of openness, but that was li limited to you know content, not necessarily software. And uh, the idea was to use open licenses or Creative Commons licenses to help foster an ecosystem to create more books so that we could actually put a book in every child's hand. Um, largely in India, the open source movement I assume is fairly strong. I mean, I don't really know, um, but uh, one has friends and they all seem to be interested in the open source. Uh, at, at KLP, pretty much all of the work we do is uh, in the open source and uses open source tools and open source development stack. Um, uh, it's a fairly powerful idea uh, and uh, I think the idea manifests itself not just in the software universe but across multiple other streams as well, education, health, or they even talk about open government, open data. So open source is a fairly powerful idea that, that, that has moved away from purely being driven by software to multiple other mediums as well. Uh, do I believe in it? Yes. Uh, my, my central passion is um, building access to information. So uh, the open source philosophy is something that I identify with very closely. I mean, I think it's uh, also important to see the um, legislative history of how this came about. Um, we're not the only country where this, where, where by default everything produced or funded by government is copyright the government. Um, our Copyright Act uh, has roots in the British Copyright Act, uh, or at least in the British copyright experience and history. And Britain for the longest time has had the notion of crown copyright, which is pretty much everything produced by the British government or funded by the British government is copyright the crown of the government of the United Kingdom. So we're not unique in the sense that uh, uh, this exists. I think the United States is actually the outlier in this case, uh, where they have a very strong uh, rule that anything publicly funded is in the public domain. That said, in India, I think the conversation with the government has been evolving and we've had some successes. And you have to build upon that. For example, the Wikimedia India chapter um, and other open content and open educational resource activists had been working with the Ministry of uh, Human Resource Development and uh, Minister Tharoor for a long time uh, to get NCRT content or the te textbooks and the syllabus under an open license. And uh, a couple of, about a month ago or so, they actually moved to a Creative Commons share like attribution share like license. So it's not that the, there's resistance to the idea. But I think it's a conversation that needs to happen, right? It's, it's, it's unfair to expect that uh, the government will wake up one fine day and say, oh, let's just do this. You need to engage in that discussion. You need to show the positives and the, and the benefits that are true. And I think once you're able to engage with the government and with different ministries in, in, in that conversation, this will happen because it's an idea that's fairly powerful, not just to us as activists, but to the government as well, to encourage and foster the creation of a larger ecosystem around their software and their content. And it's, there is actually instances where, where this happens. Um, I don't know if you know the open source drug discovery database that's um, piloted by the Center 
Council for Scientific and Industrial Research or the Center for uh, Scientific and Industrial Research. But that is an open drug discovery database that's openly licensed and run by the government of India. Uh, the data portal for the government of India, the code is open source. Um, the, 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 these, these things happen. Maybe in India the conversation really should be around the fact that having access to something isn't necessarily that that it's open. Um, sometimes in India we conflate the fact that because something is accessible online or wherever, that it's open, but we actually need to say that being accessible is one step of openness, but being under the right license so that it can be reused and, uh, you know, trans so essentially so that it can be reused and remixed is the next step of that logical discussion and the conversation is ongoing in multiple areas. Uh, so I don't know, if it's, it's certainly not as black and white as US is good and India is bad. Uh, haven't had uh, the conversation and I think we've started that and we've had successes so build upon that. It's a damn good question. I mean I don't necessarily have an answer to it. Is it hard? Yes, it's incredibly hard to do because the incentives that unpaid volunteers have is very different from, is not always very different but is, could be very different from the incentives that paid staff have. So it's always a challenge. Um, if unpaid uh, volunteers see their pool being depleted and move to paid staff, their point is then why should I do this uh, for happiness, joy or meaning and why can't I get paid to do this? So it's a very tricky, it's, it's, it's a very, very tricky uh, balance that one needs to strike uh, between uh, community driven and paid member driven. I don't think it's possible to run something at scale without paid staff uh, because there are certain functions that maybe the community either cannot do or does not have the wherewithal or requires a constant level of uh, commitment that does not necessarily happen with a community driven volunteer model and for that paid staff are needed. But I think the challenge really is when the paid staff essentially do the same thing as volunteers, there there's a challenge. So maybe one way of trying to separate the two out is in terms of distinct pools of what they work on. Um, so for example, what the community works on is purely the domain of the community and that the paid staff just perform a supporting function of what the community does rather than trying to do what the community does as well. Because without that clarity, it's a bit uh, challenging. The other thing of course is decision making, right? Uh, community driven decision making is very different from uh, organizational or, or uh, organizational uh, decision making. So there's the challenge. Uh, if if communities make decisions that are also both the organization, the paid or the staff organization has. Um, and again, I think it's the, the, ideal, the ideal case would be to set up set of uh, clear, transparent rules at the outset as to how these two interplay. But uh, it, it certainly is challenging. It's not a trivial method. Can you do away with one or the other? No, you can't. Um, so it's an evolving discussion that happens, will need to happen between the paid staff of the organization and the community is. But in general, avoid cannibalizing each other in terms of function and uh, in terms of function. So in that sense, like I said, right, like the US is uh, a, a fair outlier to me in some ways that uh, publicly funded material is in the public domain. Um, they have a very strong notion of fair use. It's, it's a fairly strong notion of fair use. Um, and. Uh, the thing is, I think a lot of these evolve out of the nature of the discourse that those countries have. Um, with, like I said, it's, this is not to say that these things are norms set in stone. Um, in India, we've been discussing more important things before we come to copyright and things like that. So we're now getting there. And I have to admit, like in India, we've had tremendous successes. The Right to Read campaign was incredibly successful. I think we are now an outlier in terms of the fact that the in terms of the fact that print impaired uh, community in India has access uh, has unfettered access to large amounts of material um, without necessarily going through copyright negotiation loops and hoops, and that's we're, we're an outlier in that sense. So. These things, the, these norms evolve from within communities and nations and the converse nature of the conversation that's happening there. Um, so is there some broad direction which they're all headed? No, there isn't. Like for example, the US, the um, audio and video lobbies are very, very strong and for them copyright is a business model. So they tend to exert a great deal of influence there. Whereas um, in India, we haven't had yet seen that and they, they exert some amount of influence, but it's they're not strong um, lobby groups are as strong lobby groups as they are in the US, um, which is why the uh, right to read campaign is so successful in India, there is no great opposition to it. Um, similarly with the NCRT things, they, they, they evolve. Uh, 
yes, they're grounded in some sort of norms and discussions that are happening in the countries themselves. But broadly speaking, uh, I think there are some things that will just take longer in other countries. So not, sure. not necessarily a bad thing. Like for example, there's NPTEL and a bunch of uh, and a few pro education related projects. Uh, but the thing is, they're not under necessarily under open source licenses. They they're they're available online, but they're not necessarily properly licensed. And I think in India, that's uh, part of the discussion that we need to have. That making something available is step one, and it's a great step. But making it available for reuse is step two, and that's the true uh, nature of uh, being open. So yeah, there, there are, I mean, there's the open source drug discovery database. There's NCRT. But in terms of you know properly licensed stuff from the government, not very much. So here's the thing: I, I don't necessarily know how uh, this happened, but I think using the UK as an example is a great uh, is, is is a great parallel for India because the UK has uh, had the same notion of crown copyright or government copyright as we have in India. And the uh, I think from 2006 or so onwards, the Guardian newspaper ran fairly. Uh, exhaustive campaign around free our data, which is essentially saying that you know public we need access to the data and proper licenses. And the conversation wasn't as much around uh, do away with Crown copyright as much as openly license the data. And the UK government came up with their um, open government license, um, version 2 of which came out I think just about a month or two ago. And that works great because the current version of the open government license is fully compliant with the notion of openness or the definition of openness. And uh, they've evolved a uh, they've evolved a broad model where they have crown copyright, so we haven't done away with that. But then data is put out under an open government license, which is fully compatible with the notions of open and with other open source licenses as well, like the Creative Commons license. Uh, in India, similarly, I think it would be futile to press for the uh, not necessarily futile, but uh, self-defeating to press for the removal of government copyright. More importantly, we should press for the uh, addition of an Indian government license, or Indian open government license, where the data is then available under these licenses. Of course, there are challenges of whether it's volunt do ministries have to voluntarily sign up for this or is it mandatory. But again, that's a that, that's a discussion that one can have. But broadly speaking, I think uh, uh, trying to abolish the government notion of government copyright will will hit too many walls and it's far, far, far easier to do that, to do this uh, around the idea of creating open government license for India. That's fully compatible with other open licenses globally. So every state government and another national government, their big thing is we want to put all of our cultural and linguistic thing online. So in the government of Karnataka who want to do some sort of uh, Kanaja, right, that was the name of the uh, supposed Kannada Wikipedia. Every government wants to do this. I mean, the government of India has this large uh, detail, you know, uh, library digitization project that, that they're doing. So a lot of this stuff is coming online. I mean, uh, so there's, there's certainly more and more stuff coming online. To me, the question to ask is, that's great that it's coming online. How are people supposed to access it if internet penetration isn't growing? And most importantly, is it coming online in open formats, right, or in standard-driven format? Just because you scan a book and put the PDF up online doesn't necessarily mean anyone will find it. It's not indexable, searchable, etc. So to me, a big challenge in India has been the the you know the slow penetration of standards compliant Indian computing using Unicode fonts or creation of open type fonts. Because so so much of our content is still print, and to bring that online means that it has to be standards compliant for it to be searchable and indexable. And I, that's taking much longer to happen than it should. So which is why. There is some amount of uh, you know local like Indic language uh, stuff on the web, but it isn't as big as it is because a lot of it is just not uh, uh, discoverable. I think the idea of Wikipedia as a model is a great one. Um, it's a, like many people have said, it's a model that should not work but works, and it mixes platform, you know, open platforms, open standards, open content, and open licenses along with an open community to create something that's truly remarkable. And um, I think Wikipedia can be examples of any one of these different limbs of Wikipedia um, in, in for so many different models from education to healthcare to governance. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have anything more to add than that, but I think it's a great example. Sure, it has downsides as well, but there's no large project in the world that doesn't. So I'd like to imagine it would increase the avail not just the availability but the accessibility of language of knowledge in local languages. But I think 
something that to me quite important is important is that it will kind of also preserve languages, right? That that these are document that these are repositories of these languages exist. Who knows? Twenty years from now, how many of these languages will still be widely spoken? Uh, and uh, in a way, it serves as a codex for that language. So I, I like that as well. Not just preserving and not just distributing knowledge, but preserving language as well.